Chapter Five of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. From the top of the Jungfrau, I first saw the Alps when, as a boy, I walked from Italy over the Simplon and climbed on foot to Chamonix and the famed Mer de Glace. Today, one shoots under the Simplon in a tunnel and reaches Mont Blanc by railroad. An electric road has pierced the heart of St. Gothard, and it was by bottled lightning that I came to the Jungfrau Jock in the glacier-covered saddle between the Jungfrau and its mighty neighbor, the Monk. Years ago, I stopped at the monastery from which the St. Bernard dogs were sent out with brandy kegs strapped to their necks to rescue mountain climbers lost in the snow. Now, at the dangerous spots, there are telephones so that one may call up Central and find out where he is. The Alps are latticed with electric ladders, and the gods' great gifts of magnificent scenery have been brought within easy reach of man. As I write these words, I am more than two miles above the level of the sea, with clouds above and below me, and giant peaks of ice all around. Right under my feet is the Alesh Glacier, a dazzling mass of ice and snow a thousand feet deep and more than twenty miles long. Beyond, through a break in the mist, I can look into a canyon where far down in the green lies the toy town of Interlaken from which I have come. To right and left there are huge masses of snow-dusted rocks. Towering above me, the peak of the Jungfrau is lost in the clouds. The Jungfrau Jacques is about a half mile from the summit, and the gigantic Monk, whose height is only two hundred feet less, is at my back, like a snow-gloved hand reaching up to the blue. The clouds, the rocks, and the snow make the whole seem a mighty valley of desolation, which just now is curtained with masses of vapor rolling to the sky and shutting in for the time being this cold, awful, stupendous workshop of the gods. In a few moments the clouds will break, and I shall have a glimpse of the Alps tumbling over one another away off to the east and the west. I have seen most of the great mountain views of the world, but none which for sheer beauty surpasses that of the Jungfrau. I have stood on Tiger Hill near Darjeeling and watched the sun gild the top of Mount Everest, the loftiest mountain on earth. Everest is almost three miles higher than the Jungfrau, but the effect from Tiger Hill is somewhat spoiled by distance and by the lower peak of Kunchenjinga, which stands in the foreground obstructing the view. From the bronze statue of Christ that marks the boundary between Argentina and Chile, I have seen Aconcagua, the highest of the Andes. It is almost two miles higher than where I am now, but like Mount Everest, it is dwarfed by its surroundings. I have seen Mount McKinley from the heights of Alaska, and I know Fujiyama, the snowy, symmetrical cone that the Japanese worship. Each has its own beauties, but none has a more beautiful setting than the Jungfrau, the Virgin of the Alps. Whether viewed from the valley or here face to face, she has a majesty all her own. My trip up the Jungfrau was made on the Cog Railway. When Mark Twain was at Interlaken in 1892, he predicted that one day would come when every mountain in Switzerland would have a railroad up its back like a pair of suspenders. That prophecy is almost fulfilled. There are something like a hundred Cog roads in the Alps and when the times are good in Europe, they must pay very large dividends. The Jungfrau Railway is remarkable in that a greater part of it is a tunnel through the rock under glaciers and snow. After running for some miles on the face of the mountains, it cuts into the heart of the Jungfrau and the Monk and crawls upward through a great wormhole excavated in the limestone and gneiss. The trains are pulled by 300 horsepower locomotives run by electricity generated by waterfalls the rack and pinion system used is a new one which is said to be absolutely safe my ride from interlaken to jungfrau Jok was delightful the three cars were walled with windows and had comfortable seats they were filled with tourists talking german french and english most of them were provided with guidebooks and maps and many were busy looking for things mentioned by others instead of seeing what they could observe through their own eyes. Only the summits of the Alps are bleak and bare. The valleys and foothills are covered with verdure. Forests of stately pines climb the sides 
of precipitous cliffs which may be a thousand feet high here all is green and there all is bare rock in riding up the jungfrau by a lauterbrunnen to the little scheidig more than a mile above the sea one goes through a panorama of magnificent scenery with the jungfrau in sight almost all the way a part of the journey is through mighty canyons the walls of which seem fortifications a thousand feet high and out of which spring waterfalls dropping almost sheer to the bottom now one is climbing over mountain pastures spotted with log huts their great overhanging roofs held down with rocks now passing through forests where the trees grow smaller and smaller until at the top they are stunted and flattened bushes that seem to be hugging the ground there are many wild flowers dandelions buttercups daisies and farther up violets as blue as the sky the snow line is soon reached and always one is in sight of the glaciers which nestle between the mountain peaks in some places the glaciers move out over the cliffs and break increasing with their icy walls the dizzy height of the precipices these ice rivers wind about through the valleys of the giant mountains above and one wonders whether there may not be a snow slide and trembles lest a terrible avalanche come down on the train during our trip a part of our way was cut through an avalanche that had rolled down this spring it was a mass of a hundred acres of snow and ice many feet thick which could be seen above and below on both sides of the road on the cleared track the snow reached high over our cars as we came out i saw a broken telegraph pole which had been crushed by the slide i had a convincing evidence here of the value of an experiment made to test the effect of the altitude upon tourists the original idea was to run the railroad clear to the top of the jungfrau a height of thirteen thousand six hundred seventy feet it goes up by stages and has now reached jungfrau jock which is eleven thousand three hundred forty feet above the sea one day it will probably be extended right to the summit and then an electric searchlight will be placed there which will be visible from the cathedral of strasbourg on the north side of the alps to the cathedral of milan on the south when the railroad up the jungfrau was projected the government held up the enterprise on the ground that invalids and people of weak constitutions would be injured if suddenly lifted into the rarefied air of that altitude and the promoters had to prove that the trip could be safely made they employed dr regnard an expert to make a test upon two guinea pigs the learned doctor put the pigs under a glass globe and then slowly lowered the atmospheric pressure within one of the guinea pigs was put inside a wheel so that it had to run to keep from falling the other was left squatting on the bottom of the globe the experiment showed that a person can live when taken quickly to a considerable height above the sea if he is quiet and remains there for only a short time it also proved that if he takes exercise or overworks he is almost sure to get the soroche as mountain sickness is called in coming up the jungfrau i had no trouble until i made my way up the steps from jungfrau jock out into the open then when i tried to hurry up the snowy path leading a distance of perhaps two thousand feet to the view my heart straightway beat like a trip hammer and i fell flat on the ground after a little while i sat down on a chunk of ice by the side of the path my heart was soon quiet and i was able to walk a few steps i took the rest of the climb by relays of about three steps and a halt and finally reached the top heretofore i have been more than three miles above the sea without bad effects as long as i took no severe exercise in going up the andes i once reached a height of fifteen thousand eight hundred sixty five feet but i noticed that as i ascended my feet seemed to grow heavy and the air was so thin that i hesitated to talk on account of the effect that speaking entailed in the railroad tunnel inside the mountains we found stations here and there where the cars stopped to allow us to walk out through cross tunnels for the view at some of these holes through the rock we were right over glaciers that rolled on and on under our eyes at the ice mere station almost two miles above the sea we were just over a great sea of snow of such dazzling whiteness under the sun 
that it was impossible to look out without dark glasses. The snow sea wound its way far down, in and out under the peaks of the Jungfrau and the Monch, until it was lost in a curve in the mountains. As I looked, two black figures on skis jumped from the station and flew like swallows down the icy surface. One of them tripped and rolled over and over, but he recovered his footing and followed his fellow, who was already a black speck in the distance. As we stood there with some of the world's most magnificent scenery all about us, I heard a party of American tourists talking. What do you think was the subject on which they were conversing so enthusiastically? Why eating and the prices of food? One man was telling how in a hotel in Germany he got a fine meal with wine for eight people for five dollars. The others laughed and held up their hands and then went on to discuss the cuisine of different hotels where they had stayed. As they continued, the smell and smoke of cooking seemed to rise and obscure one of the sublimest pictures on earth. But I knew that not all those near me were so unimpressed, for among them was a ten-year-old American boy whose earlier characteristic remarks had delighted my soul. My conviction that he was a Simon Pure American was born as we stood outside the Hotel Victoria in Interlaken, watching the wonderful alpine glow that comes just at sunset over the face of the Jungfrau. From this point, the Virgin, as she is called, is set in a framework of rocks and forests, and rises snow-white and pure, her head in the clouds. For perhaps five minutes during the sunset, her spotless silver turns almost to gold, and she looks more majestic than ever. It was at this moment that the boy came up and exclaimed as he looked, Gee, what a hill! During the trip we saw many glaciers. I counted six on one mountain side at one time, and from here on top of the Jungfrau they are to be seen everywhere. There are twelve hundred of them, about evenly divided between the Swiss and the Austrian Alps. The glaciers of Switzerland are the largest and cover nearly half of the total area of sixteen hundred square miles of snow and ice in these mountains. To hear the Europeans talk, one would think that the Alps were the only really great features on the rugged face of old Mother Earth. I am willing to concede all they claim for their beauty, but when it comes to such expressions as the biggest, highest, and most stupendous that God ever created, I must voice my objection. It is true that these mountains are the backbone of Europe, but that is only a wishbone compared to the backbone of Asia. If you could take up the Alps and drop them into some of the larger valleys of the Himalayas, they would scarcely change the landscape in the Asiatic uplands, for they would be lost in their new surroundings. Here in the Alps there is not a beautiful view that is unmarred by a hotel, and everywhere are people peddling sublimity. On the summit of the Jungfrau, and at all the mountain stations throughout the country, one finds women selling picture postcards, alpenstocks, and smoked glasses. At every stop I meet a Swiss maiden in a white blouse, a black velvet vest laced with white strings, a short red skirt, and a snowy white cap, who has pressed flowers, edelweiss, and carvings for sale. On the top of Mont Blanc, I was offered St. Bernard puppies, with a repetition of the old story of how they rescue lost tourists, and whenever I go to sleep on a mountain, my rest is broken half an hour before sunrise by the horn of the guide tooting me up for the view. But, nevertheless, it is worth it. End of chapter 5